Hello, people. We are back for some more Black Boy and uh, by Richard Wright. And this is part 33 of my readings. Um, so when we stopped yesterday, Richard was really grappling and struggling with being a part of the, um, the Black Communist Party and being a writer. Um, and basically having some new ideas and some questions and things that he asked and that he was asking and some things he was doing that were new and out of the ordinary, extraordinary. And basically it kind of landed him in the lap of much suspicion and uh, attempts at control and silencing and all sorts of other things. So um, I'll read the last sentence from yesterday. And then start. I wanted to voice the words in them that they could not say. So he's talking about basically he wanted to be a voice for the black community um, in Chicago and basically kind of present them in a way where whites or communists or people could really understand them um, more deeply. Okay. I wanted to voice the words in them that they could not say to be a witness for their living. And they were wondering if I were in the league with the police. I had embraced their aims with the freest impulse I'd ever known. I, the chari cynic, the man who had felt that no idea on earth was worthy of self-sacrifice, had publicly identified myself with them. And now their suspicion of me hit me with a terrific impact, froze within me. I groped in the noon sun. What was I after, they wanted to know. And when I tried to explain, I always, it always seemed that I said the wrong things. There were no concrete charges that they could bring against me. They were simply afraid of that which was not familiar. They were more fearful of my ideas than they would have been if I had held a gun to them. Oh, somebody said they can't hear me. Let me see if I could... Turn up the volume here. Can you hear me better? Say something if you can hear me better. All right. I'm just going to keep on from here. Um, they were simply afraid of that which was not familiar. They were more fearful of my ideas than they would have ever been if I had held a gun on them. They could have taken the gun away from me and shot me with it, but they did not know what to do with ideas. I talked with the white communists about my experiences with black communists, and I could not make them understand what I was talking about. White communists had idealized all Negroes to the extent that they did not see the same Negroes that I saw. And the more I tried to explain my ideas, the more they too began to suspect that I was somehow dreadfully wrong. Words lost their usual meetings, meanings. Simple motives took on sinister colors. Attitudes underwent quick and startling transformations. Ideas turned into their opposites while you were talking to a, a person you thought you knew. I began to feel an emotional isolation that I had not known in the depths of the hate-ridden South. I continued to take notes on Ross's life, but... Each successive morning found him more reticent. I pitied him and did not argue with him, for I knew that persuasion would not nullify his fears. Instead, I sat and listened to him and his friends tell tales of Southern Negro experiences, noting them down in my mind, not daring to ask questions for fear that they would become alarmed. In spite of my fears, I began, I became quite drenched in the details of their lives, I gave up the idea of the biographical sketches and settled finally upon writing a series of short stories. Using the material I had gotten from Ross and his friends, building upon it and inventing, I wove a tale of a group of black boys trespassing upon the property of a white man and the lynching that followed. The story was published in an anthology under the title of Big Boy Leaves Home. But its appearance came too late to influence the communists who were questioning, it, questioning the use with which I was putting their lives. 
My fitful work assignments from the relief officials ceased and I looked for work that did not even exist. I borrowed money to ride to and fro on the club's business. I found a cramped attic for my mother and aunt and brother behind some railroad tracks. At last, the relief authorities placed me in the Southside Boys Club and my wages were just enough to provide a deficient diet. So provide a deficient diet for his family, I'm sure. Mm. The, then political problems rose to plague me. Ross, whose life I had tried to write, was charged by the Communist Party with anti-leadership tendencies, class collab collaborationist attitudes, and ideological factionalism. <laughs> Phrases so fanciful that I gaped when I heard them, and it was rumored that I too would face similar charges. It was known that I had visited Ross and had taken notes on his life, and it was believed that I had been politically influenced by him, though in what way I was, it was not stated. As before, the more I tried to explain, the guiltier I seemed in the eyes of my comrades. I had taken in part, I had taken in the formation of none of the policies of the Communist Party, had expressed no opinion regarding its leadership or work, but the rumors of my dissatisfaction persisted. One night, a group of black comrades came to my house and warned me against believing in Ross's ideas. When I assured them that I did not share Ross's views, they ordered me to stay away from him. But why? I demanded. He's an unhealthy element, they said. Can't you accept a decision? Is this a decision of the Communist Party? Yes. If I were guilty of something, I'd feel bound to your decision, I said, but I've done nothing. Comrade, you don't understand. Members of the party do not violate party decisions. But if your decision does not apply to me, I said, I'll be damned if I let it act as it does. Your attitude does not merit our trust, comrade. I was angry. Look, I exploded rising and sweeping my arms at the bleak attic in which I lived. What is there that frightens you? You know where I work. You know what I earn. You know my friends. How in God's name is this wrong? They left me with mirthless, mirth, with mirthless smiles, which implied that I would soon know what was wrong. But there was relief from these shadowy political bouts. I found my work at the Southside Boys Club deeply engrossing, each day, black boys between the ages of 8 and 25 came to swim, draw, and read. They were a wild and homeless lot, culturally lost, spiritually disinherited. Candidates for the clinics, morgues, prisons, and reformatories, and the electric chair of the state's death house. Okay, y'all heard that, right? So basically, he didn't quite believe in these boys. Well... I don't know. I'm not going to put words in his mouth. I'm just going to read what he said again. They were a wild and homeless lot, culturally lost, spiritually disinherited, candidates for the clinics, morgues, prisons, reformatories, and the electric chair of the state's death house. For hours, I listened to their talk of planes, women, guns, politics, and crime. Their figures of speech were as forceful and as colorful as any ever used by the English-speaking people. I kept a pencil and paper in my pocket to jot down their word rhythms and reactions. These boys did not fear people to the extent that every man looked like a spy. <laughs> the communists who doubted my motives did not know these boys, their twisted dreams, their all too clear destinies. And I doubted if I would ever be able to convey to them the tragedy that I saw here. Wrestling with the words gave me my moments of deepest meaning. The short story, Big Boy Leaves Home, had posed a question. What quality of will must a Negro possess to live and die with dignity in a country that denied his humanity? I'll ask that question again. What quality of will must a Negro possess to live and die with dignity in a country that denied his humanity? There took shape in my mind as though an answer was trying to grope its way out of the depths of me, the tale of a flood. Down by the riverside, down by the riverside, I waded into it, 
feeling my way, trying to find the answer to my question, but it dissatisfied me when I had finished it. So casting it aside, I tried to say the same thing in yet another way. Long black song, but that did not catch the quality of my experience that I was looking for. Party duties broke into my efforts at expression. The club decided upon a conference of all left-wing writers in the Middle West. I supported the idea and argued that the conference should deal with the craft problems of writing. My arguments were rejected. The conference, the club decided, would deal with the political questions. I asked for a definition of what was expected from the writers, books or political activity. Both was the answer. Write a few hours a day and march on the picket lines the other hours. I pointed out that the main concern of the revolutionary artist was to produce revolutionary art and that the future of the club was in doubt if a clear policy could not be found. The conference convened and the leading communist attending was as advisor. I'm going to read that part again. The conference convened with a leading communist attending as, advise, as an advisor. The question, the question debated was, what did the Communist Party expect from the club? The answer of the communist leader ran from organizing to writing novels. I argued that either a man organized or he wrote novels. The party leader said that both must be done. The attitude of the party leader prevailed and the left front, for which I had worked so long and hard on, was voted out of existence. That's that periodical that he'd been writing in and inviting other writers to write in. The party leader demanded that the writers be assigned the task of producing pamphlets for the use of trade unions. I contended that it would be a mistake for the Communist Party to persuade writers to abandon imaginative work and only write pamphlets. I explained that the advantages that would be derived from long-term artistic products of the club's writers and pointed out that these were more durable products and would outweigh all pamphleteering. This, too, was rejected by both followers, huh? <laughs> I'm on his side. Then I appealed for an organizational structure that would be include provisions for artistic work of all types, hoping that in this way to eliminate our constant quarrels over tactics and strategy. But all my proposals were voted down. Now, I have a, a feeling that they're going to vote down all his proposals, he's going to leave, and then they're going to come up with all of his proposals as new ideas. That's my, that's my, that's my guess. I don't know that because I haven't read ahead of it with you guys, so we'll see. I knew now that the club was nearing its end, and I rose and I stated my gloomy conclusions recommending that the clubs d dissolve. My defeatism, as it was called, brought upon my head the sharpest disapproval of a part of the party leader. The conference ended with a passing of a multitude of resolutions dealing with China, India, Germany, Japan, conditions afflicting various parts of the earth, but not one idea regarding writing had emerged. The ideas I had expressed I had expounded at the conference were linked with the suspicions I had roused among Negro communists on the South Side, and the Communist Party was now certain that I had a dangerous enemy in its midst. That it had a, and the Communist Party was now certain that it had a dangerous enemy in its midst. It was whispered that I was trying to lead a secret group in opposition to the party. I had learned that the denial of accusations was useless. It was now painful to meet a communist, for I did not know what his attitude would be. Following the conference, a National John Reed Club Congress was called. It convened in the summer of 1934, which left writers attending from all states. But as the sessions got underway, there was a sense of looseness, bewilderment, and dissatisfaction among the writers, most of whom were young and eager, on the verge of doing their best work. No one knew what was expected of him, and out of the Congress came no unifying idea. Through conversations, I learned that the members of the New York John Reed Club were in despair at the way in which the Congress was drifting, but they took care to conceal their disapproval. This puzzled me. 
for I felt that the problem should be brought to the open for discussion, but I was glad to hear that the New York communists expressed horror at the brutal way in which the Chicago communists made demands upon the Chicago John Reed Club membership. One astonished New Yorker comrade declared, a Chicago, um, a Chicago communist is a walk and tear, he said. As the Congress grew to a close, I attended a caucus to plan the future meeting of the clubs. Ten of us met in a loop hotel room, and to my amazement, the leaders of the club national board confirmed my criticisms of the manner at which the clubs had been conducted. I was excited. Now I thought the clubs would be given a new lease on life. Writers would now be free to make their political contributions in the form of their creative work. Then I was stunned when I heard the nationally known communists announce a decision to dissolve the clubs. Why? I asked, because the clubs do not, desert, do not serve the new people's front policy, I was told. That can be remedied. The clubs can be made healthy and broad, I said. No, a bigger and better organization must be launched. One in which the leading writers of the nation could be included, they said. I was informed that the people's front policy was now the correct vision in life that the clubs could no longer exist. I asked what was to become of the young writers whom the Communist Party had implored to join the clubs and who were the inelig and, and who were ineligible for the new group. And there was no answer for me. This thing is cold, I thought. And I exclaimed to myself, to effect a swift change in policy in the Communist Party was dumping one organization, scattering its members, then organizing a new scheme with an entire new, new group of people. I had sacrificed energy to recruit writers who subscribed to a revolutionary point of view, and now my feelings fought against the waste and meaningless to which my efforts were being reduced to. This was the first time I sat with a communist policy-making body. I had had the illusion that each man would have his say, and out of the facts presented, a decision would be made. I was naive. I had merely been called in to give my approval to a decision that was previously made and it angered me. I found myself arguing alone against the majority opinion and then I made still another amazing discovery. I saw that even those though who even though those who agreed with me would not support me. I saw that even though I saw that even though those who agreed with me would not support me. At the meeting, I learned that when a man was informed of the wish of the party, he just submitted, even though he knew with all his strength of his brain that the wish was not a wise one, was one that would ultimately harm the party's interest. I had heard communists discuss discipline in the abstract, but when I saw it in its concrete form, it tore my feelings. So here we are talking about, again, being a part of a group and following these set standards and not speaking out to make things better or to make things right, to, to speak and whisper disapproval in private, but shut up in public, right? I think many of us have, um, have experienced that and it's too bad. Um, so I don't know, these are, the, these are the ways people belong to groups, right? Mm. It was not courage that made me oppose the party. I simply did not know any better. It was inconceivable to me though bred in the lap of Southern hate, that a man could not have his say. I had spent a third of my life traveling from place, the place of my birth to the North, just so I could talk freely to escape the pressure of fear. And now I was facing fear again, though I had no notion that I was slowly adding faggots to a flame that would soon blaze over my head with all the violence of the assault I had sustained. Mm. I was facing fear again, though I had no notion that I was slowly adding faggots to a flame that would soon blaze over my head with all the violence of the assault I had sustained when I naively, uh, naively thought that I could earn an optical trade in Mississippi. So you remember back then, right, the guys that worked with him refused to share information and then attacked him when the boss wasn't there. The artists and the politicians stand at opposite poles. The artist enhances life by his prolonged concentration upon it, while the politician emphasizes the impersonal aspect of life by his attempts 
to fit men into groups. Oh my gosh, I just had this conversation with some folks. Stop putting people into groups and let them choose their own groups, please. All right, I'm shutting up. The artist's enhancement of life may emphasize at certain times those aspects that or those aspects that politi a politician the artist's enhancement of life may emphasize at certain times those aspects that a politician can use. But the politician at other times eager to do good for a man may sneer at the artist because the art product cannot be used by him. Hence, the two groups of men driving in the same direction, committed to the same vision, often find themselves locked in a struggle more desperate than either of them wanted while their mutual enemies gape at the spectacle in amazement. So all of this controversy and disorganization and trying to control and trying to have independence. And then basically the enemies are sitting there basically basking in the, the mess. Why did we, why did not we writers leave the realm of politics and organize ourselves we simply did not know how. We were hostile toward our environment and we did not know how other American writers had met such problems. Totally at odds with our culture, we wanted nothing less than to make anew. And for our examples, we looked toward Russia, Germany, and France, out of step with our times. But it was natural for us to respond to the Communist Party, which said, your rebellion is right. Come with us and we will support your vision with militant action. Indeed, we felt that we were lucky. Why cower in the towers of ivory and squeeze out private words when we had only to speak and millions and, list, and millions would listen? Our writing was translated into French, German, Russian, Chinese, Spanish, Japanese, dot, dot, dot. Who had ever in all human history offered to young writers an audience so vast? True, our royalties were small and even less than small, but that did not matter. So somewhere in here, it seems like the writers were writing and their writing was being translated. But somehow I missed or don't understand like what happened with the controversy. Did they did they group themselves together and start to write and get it published? That was never explicitly set, stated so far. So I guess we just have to keep reading to find out. We wrote what we left. Confronted with a picture of revolutionary and ch uh, the changing world, there spilled out of our hearts our reaction to that world, our hope, our anger at oppression, our dreams of a new life. It spilled without coercion, without the pleading of anyone. Before the Congress adjourned, it was decided that another Congress of American writers would be called in New York for the following summer, 1935. I was lukewarm to the proposal and tried to make up my mind to stand alone, write alone. I was already afraid that the stories I had written would not fit into the new official mode. I must discard my plot ideas and seek new ones? <laughs> no, I would not. My writing was my way of seeing, my way of living, my way of feeling. And who could change his sight, his notion of direction, his senses? Do you do that, friends? And if you do... I would guess that you are feeling anxious and upset and unhappy if you are changing basically who you are to fit the mode of what somebody wants from you. My writing was my way of seeing, my way of living, my way of feeling, and who could change his sight, his notion of direction, and his senses. My relationship with communists reached a static phase. I shunned them, and they shunned me. Buddy Nielsen a member of the Communist International had arrived in New York to assume charge of Negro work. This man, it was rumored, was the party's theoretician on the Negro question, and word reached me that he had launched a campaign to rid the Communist Party of its Negro Trotskyite elements. Remember, we talked about Trotsky on the net in the last reading. Of all the Negro communists I knew, I tried to determine who would be called a Trotskyite. And I could think of none. None of the black communists I knew possessed the intellectual capacity to formulate a Trotskyite position in politics. Most of them were illiterate migrants from the southern plantations, and they had never been 
vitally interested in politics until they had entered the Communist Party here in Chicago. Nevertheless, the drive against Negro Trotskyism went on, though I was too remote from it to know what was happening. The spring of 1935 came. All right, that's our timer. I'll finish this paragraph. The spring of 1935 came and the plans for the Writers Congress went on apace. For some obscure reason, it might have been to save me. I was urged by the local communists to attend and I was named as a delegate. I got time off from my job at the Southside Boys Club and along with the several other delegates, hitchhiked to New York. All right, so he's in the middle of all this controversy and now he's hitchhiking to New York. We shall see what happens. Thank you for joining me for Black Boy. I'm not sure that will be in the right direction for you all. Thank you. Peace out. See you tomorrow.